Imagine a battery that could be charged in minutes with a capability to power a car for hundreds of miles. A tablet computer that can be rolled up and stored like a paper. Or high efficiency solar cells that are incorporated directly into clothing. All these technologies are possible with innovations powered by a revolutionary nanomaterial, graphene. Like many other hard to isolate materials, graphene was first acclaimed theoretically before being discovered in increasingly pure forms throughout the latter part of the 20th century. In 1916, the structure was discovered via powder diffraction experiments, and in 1947, the electronic properties were expanded upon by P.R. Wallace's work. Although graphene was studied in multi-layer sheets of increasingly thin amounts, it wasn't until after the turn of the century, in 2004, that Andre Geim and Konstantin Novoselov at the University of Manchester were able to isolate single-layer sheets. Since then, many of the exciting properties that had been hypothesized to exist in graphene have been confirmed. So let's talk about some chemistry. Behind me right here are one of the many clean rooms on this campus that we can produce these kind of structures. Now graphene actually, um, you need to look at a, a number of different approaches to create it. We have our bottom-up approach and our top-down approach. Now our top-down approach has to do with exfoliation and trying to, trying to get these single layers of graphene where the bottom-up bottom -up approach is more things like chemical vapor deposition or actually depositing these certain crystals on some sort of substrate, many times a metal like copper, and actually build it up that way. Those are some of these graphene structures I was describing before. It's good to kind of look at the uh, molecular building blocks and, and look more on a molecular level to just to see how these things are actually structured. Now, as I was saying before, you have more of like a, a sheet-like formation where you're actually creating a planar structure. It kind of looks sort of like a benzene structure, but you have several of these rings kind of structured where well, they're all kind of lining up with each other. So you have carbons in between, and they're all kind of creating this ring like you see here. Now, this is just a small piece of what would be something on the order of millions and billions of these spread out over a really large layer. As I was saying before, these can be deposited on a single sheet, or these can be grown up from the bottom. Um, just depends on uh, what you're looking for, but the possibilities for the different shapes and the, the different sheets you can create over different kinds of substrates are basically endless. Some of the popular bottom-up approaches include things like chemical vapor deposition, which is seen here in this video. A lot of times there's a me mechanism machine that will actually produce a uh, ionized vapor that will actually float down and cover a, a metallic base or some type of substrate. And from this, you can actually create many forms and many different shapes and structures with this type of approach. All right, well, I'm here with Dr. Dehir um, in one of the uh, many labs on Georgia Tech campus, and he's going to talk to us a little bit about some of the graphene nanostructures and uh, how they actually they put them together here. So, Dr. Dehir, um, give me a kind of an insight on how your method differs from methods like the exfoliation. Okay, and the way we do it, the way we make graphene is not by peeling graphite from uh, some external source, like most people do. We grow it in place uh, on silicon carbide chip. And we do that because we're aiming for the electronics industry. In the electronics industry, you want to have very perfect nanostopic structures. The only way you're able to do that is to grow it in place. So that's what we do with silicon carbide. So rather than shaping it after you put it down, we let the silicon carbide take it to the shape. So the silicon carbide is pretty flat. As you can see and hear in this video, they're actually using solution chemistry um, in a lab type environment to grow the graphene sheets on the on the, these mini metal substrates. Alright, so in nanotechnology, one thing that's very important is the purity of the samples. So mainly uh, we use the few roots to sonicate the samples in some kind of solvent. So before we grow the graphene in the furnace, uh, we put them in acid and, and we sonicate them for that. 20 minutes and then uh, IPA to, to finish the cleaning of the samples uh, in the 
fabrication of nanostructures, we, we do lithography iron etching system. Um, it's, we create a plasma inside. So plasma is an ionized gas. Um, and the main thing we have released in graphene is to do a plasma of oxygen. Um, so with oxygen, with carbon, it chemically reacts and forms CO2. So we're able to etch the structure of graphene by putting a mask on it and then exposing it to the oxygen plasma. And we can retrieve very, very small features by using the technique. Georgia Tech's been involved with graphene electrons for quite some time. To understand why there's so much hoopla going on about them, we need to see what properties graphene has and why. So as was mentioned before, the carbon within the graphene has sp2 bonds as opposed to sp3. This structure makes the carbon switch. It's double bond around to the three other atoms that it's connected to in resonance. So the orbits are delocalized. This allows for the strong covalent bonds to form within the carbon network, but also means that the electrons can move throughout the network too, thanks to these resonant bonds. However, the electrons have freedom to move mostly only in the plane of the graphene sheet itself. So it means that it's confined in a two-dimensional two plane, and that is what makes it a 2D material. These interesting bonds mean that graphene and its derivatives, such as carbon nanotubes, have theoretical strengths of up to one terapascal. This is much greater than the giga and megapascal ranges of current materials, such as steel, plastics, and graphene. Hey, wait a minute. Okay, so the reason why fabricated graphene is not the same as theoretical graphene is because it has defects. Nothing's perfect. And also, the non-continuous sheets of graphene, or nanotubes, or whatever, they can pull, each up, pull on each other and slide around. For similar reasons, this is why, even though graphite is made of graphene, it doesn't have anywhere near the theoretical strength as it does. Much like sheets of paper on top of each other. How they can slide around, but when you pull a single one, it doesn't have as much give. The resonant bonds also give graphene the ability to conduct electrons throughout it. Interestingly, it does not conduct electricity in the same sense as most conductors because electrons do not travel like particles in graphene and graphene nanoribbons. They travel in waves. This is due to little or no scattering of electrons occurring within graphene for distance regimes, which is known as ballistic conductivity. Thanks to this, the mean free path of an electron can be extremely long for a conductor with lengths as great as one micron for graphene. To you and me, that's really tiny, but to an electron, that's like a marathon run. However, conductivity inside of graphene is not the same in all directions. For example, some directions have almost no band gap between it, between the valence band and the conduction band. And in fact, it even acts almost like a metal. This is known as zigzag. However, in other directions, there is a much larger band gap, and so it acts like a semiconductor or a resistor. This is what's known as armchair. By varying the band gap, researchers are trying to tune graphene to act as semiconductors so they can be put into various applications. We talked about the chemistry and mechanics behind how graphene works. Let's talk about some of its applications. As you're aware, graphene is just one single atom of graphene. And as a result, it is exceptional conductivity. So what are some things you can use it for? We can use stuff like OLEDs, you can use it for super semiconductors, you can use it for transistors, and you can even use it for batteries. Such as this one, for instance. If you were to put graphene in this battery in a specific way, you essentially can make it more flexible make it even lighter than it is already because this is a very small battery. And you can even make it store more. And if this were a rechargeable battery, you could even make it charge just that bit faster. Who knows? Maybe if we put graphene in this, and maybe if we use flexible screens, we can even make our phones bend and fold in a specific way, such that we can just store them anywhere we need to. But that isn't all graphene can do. Due to it being so conductive yet so thin, graphene can even be used to spin coat fibers in textile electronics. This way you can have some sort of conductive thread for your clothes, functioning as a wire, yet your clothes won't actually feel any heavier. 
You can even use graphene and copper nanowires in sort of a core shell microstructure. Or you can just bridge them together using graphene, or you can just embed graphene within the wire itself. Either way, you can get a more flexible sort of wire, and you can still keep this wire stable and have improved conductivity as well. This is an example of another big graphene that we use in graphics chips, the microchips inside of it. Again, the transistors inside of the microchips basically transistors are three components. They have a base, they have an emitter, and they have a collector. Effectively, what it allows you to do is you put in power and then you get out a certain power. If you increase it, you decrease, it really depends. And because graphene is such a good conductor, you can effectively do this at a very fine scale. You can amplify the power quite a bit, you can decrease it quite a bit. It depends on your preference. As we've shown, graphene is an exciting emerging technology. While its use has been limited so far due to the difficulty in producing it, the material properties, which seem to take the best properties of many other materials, have spurred on continued innovation and more robust production techniques. Here in Georgia Tech's epitaxial graphene lab, we see that a bottom-up approach is being used that can produce it in quantities that will help to spur on nanoelectronic innovation.